of being I am because of all these different things. And uh, the water's about to get even hotter in this chapter because we're going to see the resurrection of Lazarus. And uh, man, this really sets things into motion and really goes off. Now, um, we're almost halfway through the book of John. And so there's still a lot to be done. But as far as Jesus' ministry as we know it, where he's running around and escaping and things like that, we're getting to the end of that, where he's running around. But hey, I bought Reese's Peanut Butter Bells for the Christmas season because you know we got a pop quiz. Hey, I'm not going to lie. Some of these questions are easy. Some are not. So good luck on this one. Five questions. We're stepping it up a bit. So let me read through the quiz questions. What I am statements are made in 10. Make sure you get them all. What does the Feast of Dedication celebrate? Who can snatch the sheep from the hand of Jesus slash the Father? What psalm does Jesus quote in chapter 10, verse 32? And what character is mentioned again at the end of 10? And why is the mention of this character significant? Okay, good luck. <laughs> I got surf and I'm drinking coffee. I am on right now. All right, number one. What I am statements are made in 10. I am the good shepherd gate door. So here's the deal. I will accept it if it's gate door good shepherd or if it's good shepherd and gate or door. Okay? So I will accept if there's two and it's gate or door but they also add good shepherd, I will accept it. Yes. No, because these are, the I am statements are, are making exact claims to an analogy. Does that make sense? Um, what does the Feast of Dedication celebrate? There it is. Rededication of the temple after Syria by who is the main rebel? Maccabees. Judas Maccabeus. Very good. Very good. All I have to have in there is rededication of the temple. That's all that's necessary to get a hunt. Get it. Hanukkah. That's a good question. I'm going to have to look that one up. Driving out of Syrians counts. Um, I'm going to have to look back on the Hanukkah thing. Let me look back. If, if, it gets, if you get 100%, then I'll check. Um, who can snatch sheep from the hand of Jesus or the Father? No one. Thank you. What psalm does Jesus quote in 1034? 82. 82. 82. What character is mentioned again at the end of 10? John the Baptist. Why is this significant? Okay, I like it. I would take the answer, the testimony of John the Baptist is important. Sure, give it to you. Give it to you. Hundred percent Christmas bells coming out. Wow! All right, Faith. That's what I like to see. Two. It's like more more Christmas spirit for me. I missed one. Maddie. Let me see. Hanukkah is the feast of dedication. 
So you are correct on that one. Very good. I don't know how you knew that. I mean, it was not mentioned in the lecture because I did not know that. So. Hey, I, I love that guy. I think the, the Juice for Jesus guy is super fun. Okay. We're on John chapter 11 today. Um, let's see. How do I want to read it today? Let's, let's put you guys up into new groups. I'm going to give you guys a number. We'll go one, two, three, four, five, six for the locations, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going to give you guys a number, and we'll get it going, all right? Six. Then you don't have to move. Five, four, three, two, one, six, five, four, three, two, one, six. Huh? Okay, you guys are in your own group. Six, five, four, three, two, one, six. All right, make your moves. Find your spot. Read the chapter together. Please talk about what stuck out. Hey, I've, I've said it before, and, um, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. I love hearing you guys reading the word together. I love hearing you guys discuss the word. You don't need to be a biblical scholar that is an expert in the field of ancient Israel in order to read the Bible and take things away. Don't ever let the Bible be unapproachable to you. These words of God are beautiful, and they speak, and they're alive, they're active, they're moving, and your initial reading of Scripture is beautiful and valid. Don't ever, I mean, if there's one thing you guys take away from this class in the book of John, it would be, I would hope, it would be, I can read the Bible. Not only I can, but the Bible is beautiful, so I'm going to. You know, please, 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 as we look at the things about the scholars in the lectures, it's just listening to you guys talk about the word and think about it and, and be jolted by certain things and to navigate your way through it. It's beautiful. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop reading the Bible all your life. Don't ever stop, okay? All right, I want to hear some highlights that people said. Maybe it's something that you came up with um, in this discussion. Maybe it's something that someone else in your group came up with that you thought was interesting, but what was highlighted in John chapter 11 by the Spirit as you read? Yes? Um, one thing that was brought up in our group is we noticed a certain theme being repeated here that was also, I think, recounted two others in the past two chapters. And it's another Jesus talking about walking in the light. Hmm. Good reading, Maddie. Do you have any idea behind it? No, I, I think you have the reason behind it. It's um, John keeps talking about Jesus being the light, you know. And we have to remember, too, that John chapter 1 brings it up right away. First things first, you know. And so it's just, it's a repeated theme. And you're, you're right when you say when we read the Bible and we see repeated themes, it's one of those things to pay attention to. And zoom in on. Wants you to hear it. Because the thesis of the book of John, <laughs> I've said this every week. Someone else tell me what the thesis of the book of John is. Beautiful. And just to add a couple things to that, in particular, the signs of Jesus that brings life. Right, But absolutely, the whole thing is to share Jesus that he might be known, but in particular, the signs of Jesus that bring life. Because immediately it's talking about what this book brings to the reader. It's important to keep remembering. What else was highlighted in this section? Yeah.
Yeah, it's, it's like despite himself, he couldn't help but utter truth. Because God's in control. <laughs> and somehow God's still working through a corrupt religious system. And it's, it's mind-blowing. It's ironic. What Trent is saying here, it, and we're going to get into the specifics of the words that Caiaphas, the high priest, states. Caiaphas pretty much says, one man should die so that the rest of the nation <laughs> could be saved. He's thinking, we need to kill him so that Rome doesn't demolish us. God is saying, no, that was a prophecy from God that says Jesus is going to die for the sin of the world like the sacrificial lamb so that people can really be saved. And it is so ironic that the high priest is plotting murder while God is plotting redemption. Yes? Um, Daniel mentioned in 32, Mary fell at his feet, and this Mary, um, every time it takes in the Bible, she, um, she did that to be a really cool tradition that she also put herself in. And like, it's a sign of her character and everything. Mm. That's kind of cool. That's good reading. That's good biblical reading. I like that. That, that could preach, right? <laughs> that could preach. Yes? And Maddie had a really good point she brought up. She says, why is Jesus crying in this situation when he said multiple times that this is going to end in life, he's going to be raised from the dead, and then he follows through with it? Why? Why does Jesus feel this way? And uh, it's, it's excellent reading to ask that question <laughs> of why. And I think kind of what you said is the, the love that he had for the people and seeing them in the state that they were in of just mourning death, like, that made him hurt. The injustice of the world, <laughs> you know? Anyways, others, yes? Absolutely, it's definitely a repeated theme. And it fits right with our thesis, right, of John, that the signs of Jesus would be seen that they may have life in his name. It's good reading, guys. That's really good stuff. Let's get into it. So we're back to our map because Jesus is moving around. Um, he's around here doing stuff. Then it says that he went out to where... John the Baptist was baptizing. Now, I kind of pose that that's probably somewhere around here on the Jordan. The scholars that I read pose that there might be a distance that Jesus was away that was a two-day travel. Because maybe Jesus waited for the exact moment which John the Baptist died, then traveled, or maybe he was four days away. And they kind of took the timing and tried to add distance to it. I'm not sure about that, but that is something that's going on here. Then Jesus is going to head back to Bethany. Bethany is very close to Jerusalem. This is where Mary and Martha live. We'll be there again in the next chapter. And then there was another um, name that was mentioned here, and it was Ephraim, right? Where was that? It's up here somewhere. If 
I can find it. Oh, here it is. So closer than Galilee, but still a bit away. And it says it's near the wilderness, which would have been this area here. Again, Jerusalem here. Jesus did a lot where he was from and where he did a lot of ministry here. Just so you have a map of what's going on and where we're at with that. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We're going to get into the story of Mary who perfumed Jesus' feet next time that we get together, which will be in a couple weeks. Um, but one of the things that Jesus says about it is, I, I tell you the truth that people will hear about this. This story will not be forgotten. And the way that it's portrayed here in the book of, of John in chapter 11 is almost assuming that the readers already know this story. So it seems like this story is truly <laughs> moving around in the same way that Jesus said. Now this is the same Mary and Martha that are mentioned in Luke chapter 10 where Daniel said every time we see Mary she's at the feet of Jesus and that's what we see here. Martha was busy working in the kitchen. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Martha comes out and says, what the heck, Jesus? I'm working so hard. Tell my sister to get in here and work. Jesus says, hey, Mary's chosen the better thing here. And um, what a cool moment of a story, but also to see that Martha is the one that's going after Jesus. Yes, she's proactive, but we see her coming out on the road to meet Jesus and to go find him. And I think that you know, maybe that, that refers to something that had happened in Martha's heart. That there was something genuine there where she's like, yeah, I just want to be around Jesus. Moving on. I spelled Lazarus wrong there. I apologize. This sickness will not end in death, just like you stated. This refers again to 9, chapter 3, when they asked, why was this man born blind? He said that you might see God's glory. <laughs> It's not his parents' fault, not his fault, but that you might see God's glory. Now, Jesus stays for two days and says that Lazarus has fallen asleep. Sleep is a um, very nice way of saying death. <laughs> and it's also a misleading way of saying death. Yet, from Jesus' understanding and from Jesus' perspective, this was a temporary thing. <laughs> And I think even our death, from Jesus' perspective, is a temporary thing. You know, I think about 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about death and resurrection and sleep. We need to remember while death is horrific, it's sleep for the believer. It's temporary. We go on living with the Lord because of his resurrection. And then Jesus tells him plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Jesus had a reason for doing these signs. John is stating that there was a reason for it. The reason that John is writing this book is for you to see Jesus' sign that you might believe. And there's a common theme here going of don't just be amazed by the signs of Jesus, but believe in him being the Messiah because of those things. Yes, you have a question. I was just going to say, like, this is the reason Jesus was so upset is that Lazarus had to go through death itself. Like, do you think death is, like, an unpleasant thing to go through? Good question. We'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. So I, I kind of opened up this section with saying that Jesus was already in hot water with the Jewish authorities. I'm going to tell you right now, it gets a lot hotter when he raises someone from the dead this close to Jerusalem. It says in verse 8 that Jesus is going back into the danger. And like Maddie had pointed out, there's this common theme of light being ba brought back up here in verses 9 and 10. It's like Jesus is unafraid because he's like, hey, where I go, the light's going. <laughs> We're going to be all right. And at the same time, Jesus knowingly walks into hot water that he knows it's going to get worse. And it's bad enough, this danger, that Thomas is saying, let's go along with him so that we can die. 
like Thomas, the always positive, great disciple of wonderful faith, right? <laughs> but to give him credit, this might be a sarcastic comment, but you know what? Thomas goes with him. <laughs> Moving on. So Jesus going into Bethany, it's interesting how much detail is given by his approach and how Martha approaches first. They talk about resurrection. Then Mary leaves her house. People are thinking, oh, she's going to the tomb. She ends up with Jesus instead. They both have individual conversations with Jesus about, hey, why didn't you come sooner? Why didn't you do this? Why did you let our brother die? You could have saved him. And it brings up this beautiful I am statement where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. We've talked about this before where, where if you take a true account of Jesus, he is one of three things. He's a liar. To quote C.S. Lewis, he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. If someone utters, I am the resurrection and the life, that's like a whoa moment. Let's not be desensitized to the statement because we understand that Jesus is these things. But for a, a human being to say this, in this time in particular, where they're talking about the resurrection of the dead, for him to say this, this is a bold, crazy claim that would show Jesus either to be psycho or a bold-faced liar or who he claims to be. <clears throat> Jesus cannot just be a moral, nice teacher. He needs to be either the Lord or he needs to be crazy. All right, this is something that's very interesting. I actually pulled a Greek word for you guys. Jesus wept, okay? Jesus, when he sees Mary weeping, it says he is deeply moved in spirit and troubled, okay? And the word in the Greek is embrimoamei, okay? I said that incorrectly. I'm not great at speaking Greek. But there is how it's written in Greek in the highlighted thing. And it's a word that had been used in the past of a snorting of horses. If you guys have ever ridden a horse, I know Kobe has. Horses always make those <laughs> kind of noises, right? Yeah, that's one too, but more of a snort, you know? And um, you guys might have um, had a really, really low point in your life when something is so brutal that you kind of utter this groan or this heavy sigh due to the emotional pain that you're feeling. And this deeply moved in spirit is this word that's used for this utterance of pain. And the question is why? Why is Jesus so moved by it? Well, I think one is it's mentioned three different times how much Jesus loved these people. I think, you know, not necessarily that death is painful. I think that as far as like physically hurts to die, I think death is painful to those that are alive still. I think he's seeing the pain of the Jews and of Mary and Martha. I don't think Jesus is necessarily concerned with the pain that Lazarus went through as much as the mourning over death. And I could only imagine Jesus, God, who was, like we saw from John 1, there at the beginning creating. I could only imagine Jesus saying, man, it was never supposed to be like this. We weren't supposed to have this. And yet people chose sin. Sin brings death. And now these um, created beings, people that I was involved with in the womb of forming, people that I deeply, deeply love, they are experiencing this horrible emotional torture 
because of the death that is brought in. I think Jesus here is moved by how horrible death is and hates seeing it be wrestled with and mourned by his close people. So Jesus, again, deeply moved. Four days Lazarus was in the tomb. Now, some, you know, just kind of a scholarly note here. There was a tradition in the Old Testament. I'm not sure where they pulled this out. But there's a tradition that the spirit hovered above the body for three days. (laughs) And some scholars would say the reason that he waited four days was to ensure that people knew that he was really dead. (laughs) You know, if you start smelling and you're afraid of the smelling body, then you're very, very, very dead. (laughs) So you can't discredit this thing by that. And Jesus says a prayer. And he says, God, I, I don't need to say this, but I'm saying it for the sake of people around me that they might know that it is you who sent me. Yes? I think... I think it probably was rotting, and I think the miracle took care of that. We don't know. He might have come out of the grave with, like, some holes, you know, or some skin being gone that needed to take some time to regrow back. We're not sure. Hmm? Well, if it's stinking, there's something going on. (laughs) There's something nasty. You know, think... Think, think about that pig that's on the road right there. Day one and two, it's not nice. Day four, that thing is <laughs> melting. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. So anyways, the prayer is interesting that it's, again, that the sign goes to the glory of the Father and goes to giving the definition of who Jesus is. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with straps of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus says, hey, he's alive. Take those things off. Beautiful story. Beautiful story of resurrection. Oh, yeah. I would have been freaked out. Some, some scholars theorize that he levitated out of the grave. <laughs> I'm sorry, <what>? <laughs> <laughs> some scholars theorize, they say, oh, this guy would have been tightly bound and would have come out like, like the baby Yoda from Mandalorian, like floating. <laughs> okay? I don't know. It, that's a little, you know, that's a little scientific, science fiction-y. From, from my understanding, it's that they were together, but loose enough that he could have wobbled out. I read way too much about this, actually, <laughs> this time coming in. So. Yeah, kind of like that. I know, it's a big one. But there's just big quotes. You don't have to write down the whole scriptures. Last slide here. There was some fallout that came from this, again, a divided response. We see people believing in Jesus. We see others that are going to tell the Pharisees. And the Pharisees who want to kill him. Interesting that the Pharisees utter two different things. We talked about 49 to 50, um, 52, but we didn't talk a lot about 47 to 48. Interesting, it says, here's a man... Or here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. <laughs> That's interesting. Like, is that really a problem? <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking, what, then I was thinking, why would he but, but watch this, okay? Then the Romans will come and take away both, and here's the word, our temple and our nation. This is the ruling council, the religious ruling council. Are they concerned with people believing in the prophet with great power, or are they concerned with our temple and our nation? Is it Yahweh's temple and Yahweh's nation? (laughs) Or is it their thing that they're afraid they're going to lose because they like 
the power dynamics that come along with it. Do you have a comment? No. No, okay, cool. Then the high priest utters these words, you know nothing at all. Do you not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that of the whole nation perish? What an ironic statement. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. Now, here on 51, again, when we're reading stories, we need to look for places where the narrator interjects some additional information. This is additional commentary from the narrator. And uh, it's beautiful and helps clear up all those things. And then lastly, plan to take Jesus' life. Jesus stays in a place near the wilderness called Ephraim. And that is chapter 11 today. A, one thing I want to point out is the boldness of Jesus. He knows he's in hot water. And he walks up to a town that's two miles outside of Jerusalem and does the most flashy display of God's power. He knows not just that he was going to heal Lazarus, but he knows what's coming. He knows the cross is on the other side here. He knows that when he comes back from Ephraim, next time we see him come into Jerusalem, he's going to be riding on the donkey. People are going to be saying Hosanna in the triumphal entry. He knows that's his last trip. He predicts it over and over again, and yet the boldness, like, it's beautiful that he knowingly walked in to be the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. Yes? Most likely the Passover where Jesus dies, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let me say a word of prayer and dismiss you guys. God, you are the resurrection and the life. And uh, we just affirm that today in our prayer. Lord, we place our hope in you. That death is just a temporary sleep because of your great power. Lord, I thank you that your power is on display, and we do. We see these signs, we read these signs, and we say, Lord, we're in with you. You are the one who you claimed. We're in, and we do believe we want the life that you have to offer, Lord. Thank you for these words, Lord. Thank you for being so bold in the midst of hypocrisy and tyranny and abused authority, Lord. Thank you for loving us, caring about us. You never pray. Amen. 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 All right, you guys are dismissed.